Medellin was a 24-7 crime scene. It was one fatal mistake that brought his demise. The agents began triangulating to get his exact location. An unnamed member of the search block got close to Pablo and gave him the fatal shot that killed him. This is the man who went from poor farmer's boy to a notorious kingpin who killed anyone who stood in his way, from rival cartel gangs to policemen and high-status politicians. There was the arguably more dangerous Los Pepes, a group of vigilantes sponsored by rival cartels who were hell-bent on wiping Escobar, his family, his associates, and his legacy from the face of the earth. By 1993, pretty much everyone wanted Escobar dead. The DEA, Colombian authorities, Medellin cartel rivals, and citizens organized in aggressive vigilante groups. But Pablo Escobar lived on the run for a long time before he was caught. It was one fatal mistake that brought his demise. Let's dive into the final hours of Pablo Escobar and uncover what nobody understands about the Kingpin's famous rooftop death. Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria was born on December 1, 1949 in Rio Negro, Colombia. He grew up with his parents, a farmer and a school teacher, and his six siblings. Pablo's family was very poor, so poor that Pablo soon entered a life of petty crime to get by. He would steal tombstones and resell them. Then he went into commercial business robbery. And it progressed to ever more violent crimes from then on. He offered protection for money, gave loans, and kidnapped rich politicians for ransom money. In 1971, he got $50,000 for Diego Echavarria, then killed him anyway. With this ruthless killer mindset, Pablo Escobar entered the illegal substance trade. They started to bring in, came from Peru, from Bolivia, and converting it into cocaine hydrochloride. And then from there, they had access to the Caribbean Ocean. And from the Caribbean Ocean, they had access to the United States. During the 1970s and 80s, Pablo Escobar's Medellin cartel was so successful that it was the single reason for the white powder addiction surge in the U.S. This alone was a reason for the DEA and Colombian authorities to want Escobar behind bars. But the reality was much worse. Escobar used his many millions to bribe police officers, judges, and politicians in order to keep the business booming. When they didn't comply, he would have them and their families killed. This was Escobar's famous motto, plata o promo, money or a lead. In other words, do you want money or do you want a bullet in your head? So from 1983, Pablo Escobar started having serious problems with the law. The Colombian government wanted him extradited to the U.S. But Escobar knew that would be the end for him. So he did what he could, bribe, threaten, and assassinate to make sure he would stay in Colombia and keep his business running. But everything he did only brought the DEA closer to him. In 1984, he had Justice Minister Rodrigo Lara assassinated in his car. The following year, he had over 30 judges killed, all of them supporting his extradition. In some cases, he killed their families too, just to prove a point. In 1989, Escobar brought down a civilian plane, believing an enemy politician was on board. 110 people were killed, bar the politician, who had canceled at the last minute. And on January 30th, 1993, when Escobar was already in his Colombian prison, he attempted to assassinate the head of the Colombian security office with a car bomb. The target was not hit, but several civilians took the hit hard. 21 dead and dozens maimed, most of them children, waiting for the school bus. Medellin was a 24-7 crime scene, all because of one man. I started to see bodies throughout Medellin, you know, and I would leave my house early in the morning and I would see cadavers on the side of the road. Pablo Escobar was trying to ensure his freedom and power but he was only digging his own hole. In June 1992, Pablo Escobar made a deal with the authorities. He would stay in Colombia in a prison of his own making instead of being extradited to the US. But the prison he built was a literal fun ground. 
the kingpin constructed La Catedral, an entertainment home-like mansion that had a spa, a sports field, a nightclub, a casino, and a zoo. Escobar could receive guests anytime he wanted. He ate chef-made food and gambled, all while conducting business on the phone. This is how the horrific 1993 bombing was ordered. Escobar could continue to live his kingpin life if it wasn't for one big mistake he made. One day, Pablo became paranoid that two of his lieutenants had stolen money from him. They hadn't. It was a group of Sicarios who blamed the missing money on the lieutenants, but Escobar didn't believe them. He saw red. He wanted them dead. Escobar's time with La Catedral would be cut short after he executed two of his henchmen in cold blood on prison premises and right under the nose of the Colombian authorities who were supposed to be guarding him. Needless to say, the DEA was listening to his every move inside La Catedral too. Now they had a real reason to escort him to a proper prison. Of course, there was an international outrage and of course, the Colombian government would move to extradite him to the US. But Escobar escaped just in time, becoming a fugitive once more. But Escobar was listening to the DEA too. He had men infiltrated everywhere. So when he learned about their plans, he escaped the prison. But this was the beginning of the end of Pablo Escobar. He would spend his last months on the run in tiny safe houses and shacks in the jungle. He would constantly look over his shoulder and listen on satellite phones for signs that the DEA has found him. He was in constant state of fear and panic. His own men could betray him any time, and many of them did. His cartel was decimated, not by the American or Colombian authorities, but by Los Pepes, a group of vigilantes made by people who had been wronged by Escobar. They were the reason Escobar sought the safety of his family in Germany, since they had been hunting down the associates of the drug lord. And let me be the first to tell you, their methods were ruthless. Some of them were Escobar's former men, some were rival gangs, and others were simply the families of all those Escobar maimed and killed to keep his position of power. The government couldn't just kill cartel people like flies, but Los Pepes did, and the authorities didn't stand in their way. Well, it, it was to our advantage. You gotta give Los Pepes a lot of credit for Pablo Escobar's demise. Los Pepes killed 300 of Escobar's men. He was on the run, on his own. So in 1993, Pablo Escobar was on his own, moving from place to place and hoping to stay under the radar. About that, here's where the story takes a crucial turn. Pablo Escobar had a family. In 1976, he married Maria Victoria Hanau. She was only 15 at the time, and her family was really worried. But Maria stayed by her husband's side until his death. Except during the last few months, she couldn't be physically next to him. Maria and their two kids, Manuela and Sebastian, were under home arrest by the authorities. They were monitoring every single call between them and Pablo. This way, they could track him down and arrest him. But that didn't last long. The Escobar family feared for their lives every second, so Los Pepes and rival cartel gangs wanted them dead, just because they were Pablo's loved ones. Initially, the government protected Maria and the children, but after Pablo's escape from La Catatral, the government seized all protection, forcing Pablo to surrender. Of course, he didn't. In October 1993, when it all got too much to handle, the family fled to Germany, they even made it to German soil. But while they were on the plane, the DEA contacted German authorities and Escobar's family was sent back to Colombia. Escobar was angry and desperate. This is exactly what the DEA wanted. His fear made him an easy target. He was taking more risks. He was making more phone calls. He was also becoming more threatening in his tones. His acts of desperation made us feel that we were getting closer and closer and closer. Now, Pablo's family was at the hands of the government. They had no choice but to stand as bait for Pablo, aiding the DEA in his arrest. Perhaps Escobar knew this, or perhaps he didn't want to believe it. But as he realized he was trapped, 
his actions became ever more haphazard. On December 2nd, 1993, Pablo Escobar turned 44. He woke up to his aunt Spaghetti. She harbored him every now and then during his months on the run. But after he finished his meal, Pablo made one last fatal mistake. He called his family. The Search Block, a Colombian super army group, and the DEA were tracking all the family's phone calls by now. So the minute they heard Escobar's voice talking to his son, the agents began triangulating to get his exact location. In an interesting parallel, on the listening end was Hugo Martinez, the leader of the search block, who was talking to his own son, who was helping him catch Escobar. It was a father-son standoff that was about to be written in blood. Hugo's son was actually the first person who saw Escobar through the window of his safe house in Medellin. He was overweight, tired, and wearing a scruffy beard, a testament to his last months lived in fear and panic. Within a few minutes, the DEA arrived at the address. It took the search block a very short amount of time to get to the neighborhood. By 2.57 p.m., mere minutes after Escobar had made the call, they arrived at his location. Escobar was still on the phone with his family when he realized his aunt's house was surrounded by cops. He had nowhere to run. Still, he refused to surrender. He had his most trusted bodyguard, Limon, by his side. And for one last moment, he felt invincible. When the police smashed down the front door, Escobar and Limon grabbed their guns and made their way onto the roof. But they were even easier targets up there. They couldn't jump to safety. The roof was too high to survive the fall. Pablo and Limon were shot multiple times until they fell to the ground. Escobar continued to fire his gun as he was falling to his death. He was hit three times. He was wounded. He continued fire. At last, Escobar's reign of terror was over. An unnamed member of the search block got close to Pablo and gave him the fatal shot that killed him. The agents couldn't believe their eyes. It felt like they'd been chasing Escobar forever. So many people had died, yet he continued to elude them. Now, he was lying on the floor, eyes open, in a pool of his own blood. This might sound like a gruesome picture, but for the authorities, it was cause for a celebration. The very first message transferred over the radio was, Viva Colombia, matamos a Pablo Escobar. Long live Colombia, we've just killed Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar once felt invincible. He had a dozen luxurious ranches, exotic animals, a fleet of airplanes, and an army that was ready to protect him and kill anyone who stood in his way. When the DEA arrived in Colombia preparing for his capture, they didn't feel like they stood a chance against him. As time went by, it became clear that the corruption factor, the intimidation factor, uh, made all of the normal uh, police work that we would do up there pretty unlikely to succeed. Yeah. Imagine trying to collaborate with the local police to catch a killer, only to realize everyone has been bribed and threatened into submission. So it wasn't just the DEA who caught Pablo Escobar. It was Pablo Escobar himself. He dug his own hole by becoming ever more violent, making Colombian authorities forgive his actions less and less. Then he self-destructed by killing his lieutenants and escaping his lavish prison which would have kept him safe until his death otherwise. Finally, Pablo Escobar's family was his greatest weakness. He loved them and he wanted them safe. He couldn't bear that rival gangs and Los Pepes were after their lives, almost as if he didn't remember he'd killed dozens of innocent families himself. When he made that fateful call to his family on his 44th birthday, didn't Pablo know that they were being watched? After all, his family had just been denied asylum in Germany. He knew they were at the hands of the Colombian government. Did Pablo want to get caught? Was he just too tired of life on the run? Or did he know he had nowhere left to run as Los Pepes had destroyed his cartel? Whatever the reason, Pablo Escobar's death came at his own hands as well as the authorities' merits. Hey, thanks for watching. What do you think the real reason was behind Escobar's grave mistakes? Let me know down in the comments section.